What are the major taxa or groups into which taxonomists place organisms? This is a hard question to answer because the system changes each time we discover new organisms and new characteristics of those organisms. So like a master taxonomist, to answer this question, we need to study and combine several of the most recent organizational systems. Warning, we're about to use a lot of scary science names. These names might make you feel like this. If they do, take a deep breath. We'll explain each of the important ones in good time. Currently, taxonomists are in the process of combining two different taxonomic systems, the Five Kingdom system and the Three Domain system. Each system has its own strengths and weaknesses. For example, the Five Kingdom system had distinct categories for plants, animals, and fungi. But it also has weaknesses, namely that this group, Protista, is not in fact one kingdom because there are too many organisms in there that are not related. Similarly with this group, Monera. The three domain system has an advantage in that it recognizes how related and uniform protista are with their other eukaryotic counterparts, and so puts them in the same category. Meanwhile, that old group Monera that has two distinct subgroups got split into the archaea and the bacteria. Currently, taxonomists use a combination of these two systems. They first split organisms by domain, bacteria, archaea, and eukarya, and then within that, they split them into kingdoms. So there are bacterial kingdoms, archaean kingdoms, many protestant kingdoms, and the kingdom for plants, fungi, and animals. Since Darwin's theory of evolution, we have learned that all organisms evolved from a common ancestor called the last universal common ancestor, or LUCA, and that each taxon evolved on a different branch on the tree of life from that common ancestor. The three major branches are the domains. So we'll start with the two prokaryotic domains, bacteria and archaea. And then we have the eukaryotic domain, eukarya. And within that domain, many different kingdoms. Plantae, or plants. Animalia, or animals. Fungi and, scattered amongst the branches, many kingdoms of protists. The rest of this video will go through each of these domains and kingdoms and summarize their major characteristics, starting first with the domains bacteria and archaea. Because they are the tiniest organisms on the planet, sometimes we don't realize how prevalent and how ancient and how magnificent bacteria and archaea actually are. For example, the entire landscape around this hot springs in Yellowstone National Park has been completely colored by the microscopic archaea that coat every single surface. Bacteria and archaea are both unicellular. They are prokaryotic, which means they do not have a nucleus or any membrane-bound organelles. They are simply a cell membrane with a cell wall around the outside and a big, long, tangled, circular chromosome with ribosomes inside to help transcribe and translate that. They are exceptional in that they can live almost anywhere, including very extreme environments, such as places that are anoxic or without oxygen, like our gut or deep in the mud. They can also live in very salty places, such as the Dead Sea. They can also live in very hot places, such as hydrothermal vents, like the geyser shown in this picture. And these are generally true of bacteria and archaea both. If you become a taxonomist, you can study the chemical and metabolic differences between these two groups. But for our purposes, the only real thing to know is that archaea are more genetically related to us and that they more often tend to live in extreme environments than their bacterial counterparts. And I almost forgot to mention that bacteria and archaea can get their food either in autotrophic or heterotrophic ways. In other words, some of them can get their food themselves, say from photosynthesizing, whereas others will get their food from consuming other items. Next stop, domain eukarya. If an organism belongs to the domain eukarya, then it is a eukaryote. What does that mean again? Well, it means that it has a cell membrane containing many other membrane-bound organelles. So those are organelles such as this mitochondrion or this Golgi apparatus that have membranes around the outside. Most notably, there is a nucleus with a nuclear envelope or nuclear membrane that surrounds the DNA. 
Within the domain Eukarya, there are many Protestant kingdoms, there, as well as the kingdoms for plants, animals, and fungi. We'll start with the protists. Does your kitchen have one of these? A junk drawer where all the odds and ends get thrown when you don't know where to put them? That's how Protista began. If taxonomists found an organism, they knew it was eukaryotic, but they couldn't tell whether it was a plant, a fungus, or an animal, they threw it into the kingdom Protista. Until later, they opened up that taxonomic junk drawer and found that there were many, many organisms inside, some of which were not very related to each other. And so they began splitting them into many different kingdoms. It's hard to make general statements about protists because they are so diverse. Look at all of these tiny branches on the tree of life. But one thing is for sure. They are all eukaryotic, having descended from an ancestral eukaryote. And because that eukaryote evolved in the water, most protists are evolved for aquatic or marine life, that is freshwater or sea life. Besides that, they are very diverse. Some are plant-like, some are fungi-like, some are animal-like, and then some are completely unique, either unicellular, one cell big, or multicellular, many cells big. Some autotroph, meaning that they get their food from the sun themselves, or heterotroph, meaning that they get their food from eating other organisms. Some move using cilia, or small hair-like projections. Some use flagella, using large whip-like projections to move around. Some use pseudopods, or false feet, to move. And some don't move at all and are considered immotile. I'll show you a couple famous examples, and then we'll move on because it's impossible to summarize the protistian kingdoms. First is an example of a protist that uses cilia on the outside of its cell to move around, called paramecium. And here's paramecia right here. Euglena is an example of a protist that moves using flagella. You can also see by its green color that sometimes Euglena gets its food autotrophically by photosynthesizing. Amoeba are a famous example of organisms that use pseudopods both to move and to engulf small organisms for food. A final famous category of protists are the algaes. Algaes are the plant-like protists. They shared recent common ancestors with plants, and that's why they look so plant-like, like this green algae here, this kelp, which is a type of brown al algae, or this red algae. They are all multicellular, and they photosynthesize to get their food. However, they are not plants because they don't have true tissues. If you look right here, there aren't really any roots or stems or anything like that. It's just one big, long, continuous blob of green. Okay, that summarizes the protists spread out amongst the eukaryotic branch. Now let's get into the more well-known branches, starting with plantae. Plants make up the vast majority of biomass on land. And unlike their algal ancestors, they have evolved very well to grow in this environment. Whether a moss, a fern, a cone-bearing plant, or a flowering plant, all plants share some characteristics. They are all multicellular, they are all autotrophic, that is, they photosynthesize, and of course, as members of the domain eukarya, their cells are eukaryotic. Those cells have a couple distinct characteristics. They have cell walls around their outsides with cellulose to strengthen them. They have chloroplasts for photosynthesizing, and they have large central vacuoles for storing water, even on land. On to an inconspicuous little kingdom in the middle here, Animalia, where we belong. Defining animals is a tricky business because they have so many characteristics. Yet there are some that they all share. Like this hummingbird, they are all multicellular. They are all heterotrophic, and they ingest their food, just like you can see this hummingbird sticking its beak down into this flower to ingest some nectar. They are all eukaryotic, of course, since they're in the domain eukarya. They are all motile, or able to move at at least one stage in their life. And they usually develop a fixed body plan over the course of their lifetime. They may change and develop, but by the time they are grown up or adult, they stop growing and they stay fixed in that form, unlike plants or fungi or algae, which will continue to grow for their entire lifetimes. And speaking of fungi, fungi are also very hard to summarize. Many of them are decomposers, such as these mushrooms that are living off of this dead log. 
Some of them, however, are predators, like this fungus that has invaded this ant's brain and started growing out of the top of it. Some of them are parasites, such as the athlete's foot that this person is experiencing. Some of them grow in teams with plants, such as this mushroom, which grows the threads of its body around the roots of the plant, helping the plant to absorb nutrients and water from the soil, getting sugars from that plant in exchange. And many fungi make our food, such as these cheeses. But there are still some characteristics that most fungi share. Most of them are multicellular, they are all heterotrophic, and many of them are decomposers, meaning they get their nutrition from dead organisms by breaking them down. They are all eukaryotic, many of their cells have cell walls made out of chitin, and most of them reproduce using fruiting bodies that release spores. So next time you eat a mushroom, remember you're actually eating the reproductive structure of a fungus. This is the fruiting body, and then the spores come out through those little gill-like slits that are on the bottom and can spread to a new place in order to grow on something else. The big exception here is yeast. Yeast are unicellular fungi. Here's a yeast in the background. They reproduce not by spores but by budding. So you can see this yeast right here is actually starting to split apart, so it does its own special type of cell division. And we commonly use yeast to ferment products. They can do fermentation, so that's what allows bread and beer to be so tasty. Now test yourself. Can you remember each of the domains and kingdoms? What are their unique characteristics? Lastly, based on that information, what do you think would be true of LUCA? That is one of the great taxonomic mysteries that hopefully we will discover more about as research progresses.